Hey, greetings, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to our talk. And we find this information very potent. My name is Dr. Stefanity Salazar. And I'm Barbara Javers. And we're giving the talk on the upcoming eclipse, the spark of expansive individuation, eclipse gateway into total solar eclipse. So be prepared for a major download. And before we get started, I just want to offer a disclaimer. Um, as living women, we claim our natural and sovereign rights, as well as our first and ninth amendment rights of the US Constitution, uh, to offer this presentation with our qualified perspective to assist in the awakening of humanity. So thank you very much. So my background, um, I'll be starting this presentation with relevant commentary on a lot of historical, biblical, and current events going on with this specific eclipse. And then our piece de resistance is going to be Barbara with her deep knowledge into astrology. And it's very interesting that a lot of us, myself, Barbara, other astrologers who are super qualified, as well as people who channel their higher future selves, a lot of us are coming into the same observation and awareness of what's going on. And so we want to share and bring together all of that at the end. And I'm going to be starting off with some of the more darker aspects of what's going on before we get into the history and the forecasting. And I do, we both feel as though there is a light at the end of the tunnel. So um, do you bear with some of the the interesting darker aspects first? Um, but we do feel that this eclipse is actually a really beautiful and positive experience that we're going to be having and not the gloom and doom that a lot of people are concerned about. And so my background is I am a bioenergetic doctor. And I also have extensive background into philosophy, certain histories, religious studies. That was one of my minors or my minor in college. Um, I studied biochemistry and philosophy otherwise. And, um, and so I have a lot of relevant commentary that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. I'm so thankful to be here with you and for all your knowledge. Um, so yeah, my background, I was raised by an astrologer. And so I grew up my whole life um, with that access. My mom would do our chart readings all the time and kind of throw transit information at us left and right throughout life and difficult situations and scenarios, which at the time I kind of shrugged off. But as I've gotten older, I've started to really understand how um, that has become so applicable in my ability to understand myself and what's going on in the world around me. And so I love to share that gift with people. And I'm now practicing astrology professionally and um, do private chart readings as well. If anybody's interested um, after today's event, please reach out. I'm also a musician and a dancer, so I'm a trained artist. My parents were both musicians. Um, my mother was a singer, songwriter, and an activist, and a music teacher. My father is a biochemist who is a research psychopharmacologist. So he raised me also with a lot of knowledge in the medical sciences. I come from generations of doctors, um, so was just raised in that context, and so also have been gaining a lot of knowledge with medical astrology and have begun work towards a physical therapy degree. And so I've been taking anatomy and physiology and exercise physiology and really working in for myself how the different organ systems and body systems play into the planetary energies as well. Um, I have been studying philosophy my whole life. My mother always gave me books about philosophy. My father studied to be a Jesuit priest and um, then became a scientist. And so he really taught me a lot about that line between spirituality and religion and science um, and how they don't have to be separate, that they can really all be held in the same vein and the same context. So I look forward to sharing everything that I've gathered with everybody. Yay. Thank you guys so much. So now we're going to offer our computer for a screen share and begin our presentation. So we are sharing and we can just click through. So there, oh, people, everyone can see the screen yeah, share. All right. Okay, great. So.
Okay, maybe just the quarter yet. And can we move the box a little bit further away? Just this over here. Actually, it's a bit down. Right. Uh, sorry. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Yay. Oh. All right. So we're going to get started. And we're first going to start with um, some basics. <laughs> Uh, so what is an eclipse, right? We're uh, eclipsing the sun with the moon. That's what a solar eclipse is. And so you can see on the top left diagram, Earth, the moon gets in front of the sun. It's considered an annular eclipse if the, depending on our elliptical orbit, if the sun, it, if the moon and the sun are spaced in a different angle further away, then the moon actually uh, doesn't perfectly eclipse the sun. So that's considered an annular eclipse. A full solar eclipse is when they're the exact same size. And that's what we're about to experience on Monday. And so here's an image of an eclipse and what that looks like. And so eclipses don't happen very often, uh, particularly full solars and over specific areas. So they are um, historically considered ominous events. They're not very regular. The lunar eclipses tend to happen a little bit more, which is the reverse. And so here is an image on the uh, left of all of the total solar eclipses in the Northern Hemisphere in the 21st century. And so interestingly enough, the next, the second to next eclipse is, so there's a 2044 Arctic eclipse and then the 2045 eclipse in August is going directly over the orbit. Our, our path of totality is in Denver, Colorado in this area. So that's very interesting as well. Um, but as you can see, there's not a ton of them. And then, so there's a few different images here of these different eclipses and how they look. And, you know, it's also particularly important that we're on the daytime side of these eclipses to experience the fullness of the eclipse. And it doesn't happen to be nighttime when it's going through. So the eclipse portal is, um, you know, it depends on where we are in the United States. So for us, it starts at, one second, it starts at 1118 and it ends at 159. So in that middle portion is going to be where we're, we come to about 65% view in Colorado. So you have, in order to be in the direct full solar pathway, you see this line here that cuts across America. Um, so a lot of people will be traveling into these areas. And this is, um, so, so we're actually in an eclipse portal right now. So we had a lunar eclipse that Barbara will briefly speak on that happened Monday, March 25th. And so our full solar is Monday, April 8th. So we are in the portal right now. So we're, this is a really important time just to be sharing um, and wishing good thoughts for our planet. And an interesting thing about this eclipse is that the the, to the total eclipse itself is actually lasting longer than the previous full solar eclipse that happened in 2017. Um, I don't know how or why that is, but we're going to be eclipsed for a longer period of time than we have been in the recent past, at least. So here's an image that just shows you where the path of totality is and where the percentages are for how much we will be able to see the eclipse. So for people who are in the path of totality, when it comes into full eclipse, they can take off their glasses um, and just experience the corona around the sun without any problems. But those of us that don't experience that or the beginning um, going into it or coming out of it, it's absolutely necessary that you wear very dark shades so you don't image, um, ruin your iris or develop a pterygium. So what happens during an eclipse? It goes dark. <laughs> um, the stars of the planets become visible and to the right image, you see the actual alignment of what people are going to see for this specific eclipse, which is incredible. Like there's literally an alignment that's happening a lot of the planets are going to be polarized within the 11 o'clock to one o'clock 
degree if you're looking at the um, moon and sun as a dial. So it's a very polarized eclipse. And um, so it becomes cooler. Um, I have experienced a full solar eclipse in the past and I got cold during it and I was not prepared for that. Um, so um, for people who are in totality of you, like bring a jacket. Um, animals and insects start acting like it's nighttime. And it also feels ominous and holy. It literally feels like you're looking at the eye of God staring right back at you. Um, everything becomes very quiet at that full eclipse moment. The animals become quiet. The birds become quiet. Uh, you feel a sense of peace within yourself. Um, and uh, so it's a very opportune moment to offer your prayers and receptivity, which we will be discussing more of shortly. Just one moment. Okay. Um, so there's a couple interesting pathways we're going to be discussing. So the most recent eclipse was an annular, it wasn't full solar. And it happened on October 14th, 2023. And as you see, it crosses over in an area in Southern Central Texas. And then in terms of recent total solar eclipses, America is getting the spotlight with a lot of these eclipses. Um, it was August 21st, 2017. That's the one that I witnessed in Oregon. And as you can see, there's a cross point that crosses in the southern tip of Illinois, but there's a few crossover areas in some other states as well. And Louisiana, or is that Louisiana? Um, Illinois. Illinois. And Illinois and Missouri. Missouri. Um, excuse me. Uh, so um, this is considered pretty monumental and it obviously shows the shape of an X, right? X marks the spot. And we'll be getting into some of the prophetics about the significance of that. Uh, the spot that is closest, the town to the central point of this X is called it's called, pronounced Cairo in Illinois, but Cairo, right? Little Egypt, Illinois. Um, so there's a lot of significance around that. Um, that area in the crossover point is also, uh, there's a town in Kentucky called Salem, uh, Carbondale, and Rapture. So you can see here the triangulated aspect of this. Is there a way you can minimize that? And... Um, and so we have, you know, a few visible symbols, right? We have this alpha or aleph symbol. And we also have that you can see there is like represented as an A, a capital A, though granted this the symbol. Give us one second. We have to yeah, go back. I don't to minimize this. Okay, let's just go back then. So um, so the, the small case for alpha, um, which is obviously Greek or Aleph, the Hebrew first letter of the alphabet, is a lowercase a, which is an, an alpha. And then we also have a tau and a, and a chi, which is an X and a T. And it also in the capitalized A it looks a lot like, to me, anarchy. And as those of us who have studied anarchy can recognize, um, anarchy is definitely not chaos. It's a higher order of self-governance once everyone becomes... Um, sovereign enough to be able to regulate themselves versus um, needing Big Brother to regulate them. Um, and so, okay. Okay, so a few interesting synchronicities. Um, and this is uh, some of the information that I pulled from Robert Edward Grant, who is an incredible polymath for those of you who are familiar with him. And he does a lot involving mathematics. And um, so, oh, sorry, I'm, I keep moving the, the the bottom screen so I can see some of the information. Can we go back, please? Mm, oh, yes. I'm going to have to stop the screen share just for a second. Give us one second. And... I'm, I'm used to Lenovo's. Okay, perfect. Okay, so a couple interesting synchronicities.
Okay, so the full eclipse apexes over Austin, Texas at 1.37 p.m. Um, interestingly, um, in physics, 1 over 137 is the fine structure constant, um, and that's the reflection absorption of photons and the separation of dark and light, which is pretty much like what we're looking at when we look at an eclipse. It also has, it's like a differential that has to do with the wobble of an atom. But as Barbara will be expressing um, with the precession of the enoxes, the macro wobble versus the micro wobble. And so that's just an interesting metaphor and uh, symbology there. And again, that's uh, denoted as uh, lowercase a, like I had mentioned earlier, which uh, is also recognized as the bull in Greek, Hebrew, and Arabic. And what is the mascot for the University of Texas but the longhorned bull? And we'll be discussing a lot more with bulls in a little bit between myself and Barbara as well. Um, and another discovery from Robert was the perfect triangular proportion. A perfect triangular proportion is 5, 12, 13. Um, and that is also denoted in the Leonardo's Vitruvian Man. And uh, the only triangular angle that allows for the squaring of the circle is the perfect triangular proportion. Um, and it's also, uh, you know, denoted in shapes of alpha and tav and cha and chi. So it's just really interesting to see this like alpha omega component as well. And just further recognizes the fact that we're living in some type of holographic simulation of some sort to be able to experience these. So I pulled this image off of the internet above. And so the 2024 eclipse is exactly six years, six months, six weeks, and six days apart since the 2017 eclipse. That's also my address, 6666 um, South Lafayette. Um, but interestingly, um, as I mentioned, Aleph is the first letter of the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet. Ty uh, Tav is representative of Omega. So there's this Alpha Omega with this 6666 component. Um, and uh, thank you. The Aust I, I received a, a note here that the Austin area code is 512. Is, is that the same proportions? And so there's the same proportions as the divine. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, Lex. So there's another synchronicity there um, with the Austin area code and the, the divine proportion of the triangle. Um, interestingly, in J.J. Hertog's prophecy, The Keys of Enoch, it states that our human species will be moving from a 666 orientation into a 777 uh, during major cataclysmic shifts on the planet as we are going through an awakening and an activation on a planet as a whole. And that will be calling into being the, the center of the area of how things are happening will be shifting from the Middle East to the Middle West, and it'll be the New Jerusalem with USA um, capitalized when he marks it in his texts. And there's a whole return of the dove prophecy um, that states that when the eagle of the north and the condor of the south come together, there will be a true revolution against the shadows of darkness. And um, after that, the entire like fallen energies of this planet will start to fall like dominoes and we will be receiving the return of the dove. Um, and this is, it's a Judaic tradition, this prophecy, but it is on the mystical end of it. So I do consider it to be beyond the demiurgic components, which we'll be discussing later on. Um, and in the prophecy, it says eventually we'll be moving into an 888 as we continue to evolve and expand. And it, it continues after that. But we will be observing some 777 components in a little bit. So... Um, You'll have to forgive me because I can't actually see half of the screen. So uh, a lot of what I'm speaking about is by memories. But in general, uh, there's some interesting some interesting symbolisms that we continue to go through with the towns, for example. So in the 2017 eclipse, there were seven towns that called Salem that the eclipse totality or within the within that range went through. Salem does mean peace in Hebrew. It was the home of Melchizedek and sometimes synonymous with Jerusalem, if I'm understanding correctly. Um, now, the seven towns that um, in Salem that America crossed through, to be fair, um, so those were in 
Oregon, Idaho, Wyoming, Nebraska, Missouri, Kentucky, and South Carolina. To be fair, <laughs> Salem is the eighth most popular city name in the United States. So there was plenty of other Salems that it did not cross. In fact, it'd probably be hard for uh, an eclipse to cross anywhere through the United States that didn't have at least one town of Salem mentioned. Um, according to the Jews, the 2017 eclipse... Um, so according to like Talmudic Jews, um, not necessarily the mystical sects of the Judaic traditions, uh, the 2017 eclipse marked the end of peace and the final curse upon the wickedness of America. Um, that is not necessarily um, my interpretation of things. However, we are seeing self-fulfilling prophecies on a number of levels play out on planet Earth right now. So one of the crossing points for the 2017 and 2024 eclipses happens to be in Salem Road and a town near Salem, Kentucky. Um, so Salem on top of Salem's, right? Um, so peace squared, right, at ground zero. And that's something I like to hold on to um, as a metaphorical component for which we as creator beings manifest into our future planet is this, this peace squared aspect um, and envisioning the new Jerusalem, or however you want to refer to it in your own mind, uh, in accordance with the return of the dove prophecy. So now uh, looking and focusing on what is happening with the 2024 eclipse pathway, there are seven towns named Nineveh that it cr we cross through. And there's only actually nine. So there's in North America, because there is one in, in Canada, there's only nine towns named Nineveh. So this one's a little more interesting because it's rare. And not all of them are in actually the totality path, but they're all in about 80% or above. Um, and so almost perfect totality, there are seven towns. Um, so the total solar eclipse, eclipses over... Um, so historically speaking, a total solar eclipse um, did eclipse over the original town of Nineveh, which was a town in Assyria, so modern day Iran, Syria, um, or Iraq, Syria, um, on June 15th, 763 before current era. Uh, that's the one they believed it to be, at least. Uh, this fits the time frame for the life and career of Jonah, the prophetic Jonah and biblical story. This eclipse would help explain the dramatic reaction to Jonah's preaching. So he he basically went to Nineveh and which at the time allegedly was uh heathen ran um and people were living in wickedness and he basically warned everybody that impending judgment was coming and if they did not repent and or fast or clean their act up um they would not be spared. And so people actually listened to him. Um, so according allegedly to prophecy, he he was a Jew who preached to heathens, but the heathens actually listened to him. Um, now, history does have a way of changing the storylines around, um, but I think the, the gist of the story and the accuracy of um, people having an effect you know, the eclipse is having an effect on people and shifting timelines. Um, so the seven towns that we're going to see cross through for April 8th is Texas, Missouri, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and New York. And so here is a map of the towns of Nineveh um, that are in total trajectory and in approximate and non-approximate. Um, so there are only three paths, uh, excuse me. So only three are in the path of totality. The other five are about three quarters or more of the full eclipse. And there are eight total American towns named Nineveh. I just mentioned that. So um, a little more to continue on Nineveh. So in route to Nineveh, as the story is told, Jonas was swallowed by a whale before it spat him out where he was trying to get to. And, um, and the, he was allegedly in this belly of the whale for three days and three nights. And to quote, um, Matt 1240, 
For as Jonas was there, it was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And we'll get a little bit more into that significance in a little bit. Um, but uh, there is a whale constellation in the sky referred to as Cetus that represents the story, Cetus the whale. And as you can see, there is an image of Cetus the whale. So a quote, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. So that's Matthew 12, 39. So, you know, people are looking for a signs. Apparently the signs aren't as visible as they used to be, but under the prophet Jonas. So if you take a look at this map, um, Pisces is, is highlighted in it, but if you go slightly to the left, you see the constellation Aries because it goes Aries into Pisces. And directly under, directly under Aries and Pisces, you see Cetus, the whale. So Cetus and our our full solar eclipse is going to be happening in Aries. Um, and so directly under Aries, we have Cetus the whale in the sky which is very interesting. And so the seven towns of Salem cross the seven towns of Nineveh uh, with eclipses spaced, um, if you round it up, seven years apart. So you get that 777 symbolism um, that we might be looking for in terms of these prophecies that are coming through. And of course, like we mentioned, they're crossing over Cairo, Cairo, Salem, Carbondale, and Rapture. So in addition to there being a full solar eclipse coming up, we are looking at a comet that is also traversing through. And that comet will be uh, visible, if you can see in the lower right, at about 11 o'clock. So people who are in totality when it's dark enough will be able to see this comet. It's the Pons Brooks Comet. It's also referred to as Devil's Comet. And so it'll be it'll be traveling through April through August in our trajectory. Um, so the closest area will be um, like May, June. Um, so it is coming through and invisible with certain eyewear um, for a little bit. Um, this is a periodic comet, 71 years orbital period. Um, and so there's historically a few mappings that they've been able to refer to this comet historically. Um, in 1812 is when it was discovered uh, that this is a continual comet, Comet 12P, Pons, Brooks. And um, it has been in the past also followed by some meteor impact. So moving on into some strange and interesting things, what I would consider to be old paradigm manifestations um, that are being activated on this planet. Um, <laughs> So to quote Numbers 19.2, this is the statue of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, speak to the sons of Israel that they bring you an unblemished red heifer in which is no defect and on which a yoke has never been placed. So um, there are a lot of Abraham, like the Abrahamic religions, Judeo-Christian, because Christianity became compromised early on, and the Abrahamic religions in general um, tend to follow, this is my opinion of what I would refer to as the demiurge or the false God, um, and that at, at best is highly egotistical and claims some dominion over third density planet earth. It's very materialized on this planet today. Um, now I don't want to discount, there's been mystics from all traditions that have come through regardless, right? We've got beautiful mystics through all of the major traditions, Eastern and Western, but as Barbara will be speaking to later, this is the age of where we have to remove our identity allegiances to the hardest, lowest common denominator level and start to look into ourselves and see ourselves as our own leaders and not follow these false prophets. So one of the things that is being manifested on this planet, like literally fabricated, is the second coming of Jesus that everybody wants. Um, and, you know, the, the whole demiurgic prophecies. And so one of them is this red heifer prophecy and sacrifice, right? Um, animal, animal sacrifice. So we've got these cows 
that are, there's currently three perfect red heifer cows um, in Texas um, that are being transfer transferred to Jerusalem and, um, you know, trying to bring on World War III, essentially. And so um, here we are. <laughs> Um, so the, the the goal is that they sacrifice this red heifer um, where it's overlooking um, Temple Mount. Uh, Temple Mount currently has a mosque placed on it. So that's problematic for the Judaic tradition. And the Muslims um, are have no plan on having their um, sacred space um, that's sacred for their tradition be completely destroyed to rebuild any temples. Um, but there is this Mount Olive that sort of um, elevation wise it sits over and overlooks Temple Mount. So I guess the the prophecy is that this red heifer, um, they're going to build an altar and sacrifice this poor cow um, on top of uh, this um, area of where olives are growing, which is interesting because olives do tend to represent peace. Um, and so it's almost like the, the defamation of such uh, with this prophecy. Um, so uh, there have been nine uh, prior red heifer ritual sacrifices, and this one is considered to be the 10th and the final one. And so we don't know for sure if they're actually going to follow through with this, but there's a lot of talk that they are planning on doing this and quickening their, their plan. Um, and in order for them to be able to sacrifice this red heifer, it has to happen um, between April 1st and Passover. So um, in terms of Hebraic uh, biblical New Year. We're on, that's uh, we're in Nisan one, and um, so the the eclipse falls within that range of time as well. There are going to be two eclipses that cross over Old Jerusalem or the original Jerusalem, um, but not until twenty sixty time period. And so I think the people are just getting, you know, they're just ready to go, um, and so. There's there's that, the whole red heifer, in case people were wondering what's going on with that. And Barbara's going to speak very um, briefly right now on the birth of Israel. Yes. So this is the chart for the birth of Israel, which um, happened during an eclipse. And so I'm going to kind of show you real quick um, with my mouse. So you can see the moon is down here. And... The sun is over here. The reason why is that it's actually one week away from when this eclipse is, eclipse is going to happen. So you can see the sun is lined up with the north node of the moon. An eclipse happens when the sun and the moon are lined up either opposite each other or conjunct each other and also lined up with the nodes of the sun and the moon. So you can see the node is in line with the sun and the moon a week from this date is, or a week before this date, sorry, would have been right here, even with the sun. And so we had an eclipse happen at the birth of Israel. At the end of my talk, I'm also going to show you that Benjamin Netanyahu was also born during an eclipse. And I'll do kind of a chart reading personalized for him of how this eclipse that we're experiencing on the 8th lines up with the eclipse of his birth all very interesting lots of royals and people that have eclipse birthdays and and one of the reasons why we are focusing a lot on israel right now is because a it's in current events with a lot of crazy stuff that's happening um that is being done unto others right now as well as the biblical component um and both mystical jews and the talmudic jews um uh, have an infatuation with eclipses as well and that area is the birthplace of not only Christianity and Judaism, but also Muslim religion. And so that region is um, a very rich source of lots of religious dogma that are still practiced today. Exactly. The sort of the origin of the Abrahamic religions, um, which has basically fueled um, the, the age of Pisces that we're in, right? We went from Aries into Pi Aries was the god of war. We had the age of Aries. And then we went into the age of Pisces that they never really got over the Aries component. So they just brought the war into a religious component and dogmatized religion in this particular cycle of Pisces, um, which very much like religion throughout our you know last couple of thousands of years has 
been the most cohesive component for every different tradition um, that there's ever been. And, and now as we're entering into the age of Aquarius, we're entering into more of like an innovation component. So maybe that religion then becomes an internal spiritual spiritual need without the use and need for the external dogma that came with the age of Pisces. So I have a friend, um, Michael James Garber, and he specializes in uh, an evolutionary component of what was originally Dolores Cannon's QHHT. And so he has put a lot of people through um, deep hypnosis. Um, and a lot of them have recently been speaking a lot on eclipse, the eclipses, both past historical eclipses. There was one patient who practiced Zoroastrianism and there was um, a particularly punctually important eclipse during that time that uh, related to a comet, as well as people who are going under talking about a future eclipse that is going to be highly significant for the crystalline assumption of mankind and the seed point that determines both like a dual planet split, as well as those who are on the vanguard for new earth. And it's quite, he's not for certain it's this upcoming a quick eclipse, but um, it does feel very significant that it could be this eclipse. So we are quickening into um, a potential for for literally activating dormant genetics and higher self-activation and bringing in a new earth while there's a simultaneous new earth and that parallels this like old earth falling and dying. So there's like the death cult and the life cult. And I bring up Zoroastrianism because it's literally... Um, a focus on good versus evil, um, like this Ahura Mazda type character um, plus this demiurgic type character. And they're constantly at, at will. It's a battle of will. And goodness at the end always prevails, even though we can go into very long spouts of darkness. Um, so, and if you look at that too, from a perspective of the yugas, there's the major yugas and the minor yugas and the minor yugas, from my understanding, this is not my specialty, is we are um, entering into the Satya yuga out of the Kali yuga. From a major yuga perspective, we are deep in the Kali yuga. Um, but there's just cycles within cycles within cycles um, from a galactic scale, right? And so here we are living out our smaller one. Another significant component about Zoroastrianism is it was the first monist, it was the first monistic religion, but it was also very monist in the sense that it recognized that beyond the duality, all is one. Um, but from the monistic component of like the one higher God, um, the goodness aspect of this Godhead, um, so there's source and then there's this Godhead, uh, is um, basically what later was adopted in their own versions of the Abrahamic religion. So it was the precursor to the Abrahamic traditions. And um, so part of the Zoroastrian prophecies include a comet that will come and destroy Earth. Now, it's not clear exactly how they mean by that, if it's like literally a comet that like an, a quote unquote, like sort of Armageddon type comment or if it's more of like a revelationary type comment that will destroy maybe the wickedness of earth there's a lot there for interpretation the ancient greeks um term for like death of planet by fire um is ekpyrosis which was a conflagration they also had the cataclysmos which was um sort of like the death by water which we've already seen in the great deluge of the past um, but during this time period, there will be great judgment upon the sins of man um, and or referred to as like Sabbath day, right? A lot of different traditions have names for this. Um, and those who live with purity um, in their hearts will literally, it's like the sins will be, will be burned away. So those living with, and it, a lot of it from a lot of perspectives is a self judgment, like our higher selves that are connected to this oneness oneness judges ourselves. Like, did we learn our lessons in this last cycle and third density earth, or do we need to repeat ourselves? Um, so it's really, you know, we're all, we all are connected with high, with souls. And some people are on the evolutionary path. Some people are on the stasis path. Some people are on the de-evolutionary path from a higher perspective. We chose to be these characters for each other, for lessons on this planet. 
Um, so from the highest level, there's not really a judgment, but from third density earth and a few degrees higher than that, there's definitely some judgment of what is good and what is not. This is not a subjective statement. Um, certain things are purely evil, regardless of how you look at them from our perspective. Um, and so when we take a look at ourselves, like the more that we're living with, like needing the detoxification or the mental detoxification, there's going to be more to burn away, right? It's going to be harder for people who are more dense than it is for the people who are living lighter in their beingness. Uh, they also had a word that comes after this, like this process called Frasho Kareti, which is making wonderful, like to make wonderful again. So what are we doing with we, when we respect our mother, our planetary mother, we're making this place a paradise again, a heaven on earth. Um, so uh, taking a look at some, some historical eclipses is this next segment. So I love this quote from this Viking book that I recently read. The Lord made his will known through the Northern Lights, solar eclipses, and comets, anomalies in the perfect and orderly world system he had created and set in motion at the dawn of time. The monks were always careful to document such events because together they constituted a network of signs, which, if studied together, uh, reveal God's plan for humankind. I uh, apologize for the different, um, like I should have set this PowerPoint as a, um, like set it and set it differently because on Barbara's computer, a little, a few things get cut off or changed around. Um, but a lot of cultures in the past definitely viewed eclipses as ominous and, and scary and evil. Um, part of it is because there's just a lack of preparation for it and lack of comprehension of what was going on. Um, but there have been some really interesting components of very powerful avatars for good and for evil being born during the time periods of eclipses. The prophet Muhammad, his son, Ibrahim. Um, as we've discussed um, and we'll discuss further with Netanyahu, uh, Donald Trump, like a lot of these people are within eclipse birthdays, um, which is just very interesting. So some of the different eclipses, uh, so there was the Odyssey eclipse that happened uh, and the Odyssey eclipse is significant because it dates the time of Troy. Um, there was a solar eclipse in May 25th, 585 before current era um, in Asia Minor that literally brought a, uh, an abrupt halt to a battle that was about to take place called the Battle of Hales, also referred to now historically as the Battle of the Eclipses, as the Warren armies during this beginning of their battle laid down their arms and declared a truce. They discerned, decided it was a sign. So again, here's another example that eclipses don't just bring war, they also bring peace, right? Um, and here we are in the battle of wills, right? Are we going to the war trajectory or the peace trajectory? Um, the battle of Larissa was a military engagement with the armies of the Byzantine Empire. In the Peloponnesian War, there was two solar eclipses. The war lasted 27 years, plus a third lunar eclipse. Um, and one of the solar eclipses... Um, was the year that the war began. Uh, Jesus Christ was crucified during an eclipse. And to quote Luke 23, it, um, it was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until, th until three in the afternoon because an eclipse was in the sun. Uh, the first historical account of uh, the first historical account of a solar eclipse and comet was in 418 current era, um, and that was during the Visigoths and Holy Roman expansion. A lot happened that year. I couldn't find anything within the, the week to the eclipse or week after, and a lot of interesting geophysical upheavals and events tend to play, take place within 90 days after the eclipse. So that's also something to take into account with everything that might be unfolding is the 90 days that follow here and after. Um, so, so there's that. Um, eclipses, uh, like I mentioned, did precede the birth of Muhammad. So um, I can't read like what says. 
um, I don't know what that first one said. Oh, okay. Uh, perfect. We're going to leave it like that. So, oh, no, we're not because you're, there's this the same way. Okay. okay. Yeah. Sorry. We can't, I can't <laughs> see what's on the top line. I'm just going to keep. I was trying to do that, but it's, it's okay. We don't want to, we're afraid to touch it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in 1715, we have Haley's eclipse. Everyone can read what's on the top line, except for us. Um, in 1715, we have, uh, Haley's eclipse. Um, and that was significant because it's the first modern prediction of eclipses using the Newtonian theories. Um, it's not that, and you know, with the stand, the classical model and the standard model do have a lot of accurate components. Um, but as many of you guys know, who study beyond the standard model into unified physics, that allows for the explanation of the 122 orders of magnitude difference between the smallest measurable thing and the largest measurable thing comes together in a unified way. So we we can move beyond, but the, the Newtonian physics still does allow for these accurate predictions. And Newton himself was very much into the occult arts as well. Um, the September 17th, 1811 uh, Constitution Day was an annular eclipse recorded by Thomas Jefferson, um, but there is some significance there. Yeah, I did pull that one up and I can't really quite remember exactly what it was um, that I found, but I can try to look at it real quick while you're, um, cause I have it in my astro. Okay, perfect. I'll keep going and Barbara will jump in. Uh, July 28th, 1851, uh, we see the photograph on the lower right was the first photograph of an eclipse captured in Prussia. Um, the Colorado eclipse that happened in 1878 was significant for Colorado history because prior to that, the only people who really lived in Colorado were mining for gold. Um, and after that, suddenly Colorado became highly expansive. People started moving here. They realized it's a great place for the study of science. Um, Tesla moved his observatory to Colorado um, within a couple decades after that. Um, or decade or so. And um, and a lot of people realized how beautiful Colorado was as well. So it really um, sparked shift for uh, our Colorado history. Um, and interestingly, uh, the Titanic sank during an eclipse. Now the eclipse, the, the Titanic ex ex sank on April 15th and the eclipse was on April 17th, two days after the sinking of the Titanic. But the Titanic sank and it's its um its route to America was in the exact route of the direct pathway of the eclipse. So yes, so the Constitution Day eclipse is interesting because we've had a recent return of Pluto in the sky to the same point where it was on the signing of the Declaration of Independence. So on the Constitution Day eclipse, Pluto was in opposition to the eclipse which was in Virgo. So it's an interesting presence of Pluto that we'll come back to later when we get to the Pluto and Aquarius and Pluto return section. Thank you, Barbara. So I thought this was really interesting and the map on the top um, shows the exact route of this particular eclipse in 1868. It's called the King of Siam's Eclipse. So uh, there, so what is now modern day Thailand, uh, there was um, a king uh, named Mongkut of Siam, and he knew that there was some sort, he was formally trained um, in the Western classical world. So he was very astute with physics and the math of that time. And due to his scientific prowess, um, he helped stab off the European incursion and thus saving his kingdom and offering the day for feast and relaxation for his people on Eclipse Day. Um, there was definitely some tension happening going on, and he realized that if an, a, there was an eclipse, the eclipse could go in one or two directions. So he figured it out um, ahead of time and um, created that day as a day for his people um, instead of them manifesting consciously like gloom and doom they manifested peace and prosperity and joy with um, a holy day um, of feast now interestingly enough um, even though it was um, wonderful for the kingdom um, he ended up dying as a direct result of the eclipse um, 
During the eclipse time, mosquitoes come out and he happened to be bit by a mosquito that carried malaria, which then killed him. But at least his kingdom was saved. So this is an interesting little, really um, quick, quick and dirty um, explanation of biogeometry and uh, more particularly physical radiesthesia um, as a whole, uh, biogeometry being a subset of physical radiesthesia. Um, which is a very polymath subject, but it is the study and of the quality of frequencies, um, both the negative and positive frequencies that are healthy and detrimental to biological life. Um, harmful frequencies found within a portion of the bandwidth of what is referred to as vertical negative green. Now it's called that because it's just opposite of the color spectrum of the, the frequency spectrum. In biogeometry, instead of the frequency spectrum going from uh, like radio waves, non-ionizing, all the way to the ionizing, like um, intense waves. They've just taken that whole field and they've turned it into a pie chart. And so negative green carries a vast and infinite amount of frequencies within that bandwidth, okay? Um, so within that vertical negative green bandwidth, there are, I'm sorry, within the negative green bandwidth, there are horizontal and vertical uh, negative green frequencies horizontal being more harmonious to life, vertical meaning more detrimental to life. Um, so examples of uh, measuring vertical negative green um, can be found in toxic chemicals, pollution, parasites, man-made electromagnetic frequencies, uh, bad vibes, volatile emotions, um, you know, experiences of rape, murder, that sort of thing. Earth grids that have gone negative as a result of the above issues. Um, and certain angular and, and shape projections. Um, and that includes the underside of platonic solids. That's why when you see these, um, you know, like the Great Pyramid of Giza, for example, it's not a perfect tetrahedron. There's indentations. It actually has eight walls plus the base. Um, a lot of these ancient mosques um, and current mosques, they put a little like dome or petal loop at the top versus a perfect dome shape or triangular shape. And that's because the underside of those shapes, um, they're basically offsetting the vertical negative green as a result. So that's important for um, architects to study this type of subject. Um, so uh, if they're not corrected, right, they can cause damage. Um, one other component that causes vertical negative green is the shadow side of objects, certain objects. So, you know, what happens during an eclipse, right? We're in the Earth's shadow, like the Earth is in the shadow of the sun as a result of the moon. Now, we're technically in a shadow, you know, every single day during the nighttime period as well, if you want to think of it that way. Um, so it's not particularly unusual, but it is unusual for it to happen during the daytime hours. And so that might also be why on a subconscious level in all of us, we have this sort of um, historically speaking, this ominous component because we are experiencing some level of vertical negative green. I'm excited to measure this myself um, during this particular eclipse to see the difference. Um, so anyways, shadows of spears propagate vertical negative green waves. For what that's worth, just wanted to bring that element into the discussion. Okay, so a couple really interesting, um, you know, things getting weird into the current events of what's going on. So um, for one, uh, you know, there's a lot going on in Eagle Pass right now with the illegal immigration that is just coming on through our southern border, right? So Eagle Path, it, Eagle Pass is the first area to experience the totality eclipse coming into America for this particular eclipse, eclipse route. Um, in addition, we have the National Guard uh, being called all across the board in these general areas, claiming it has to do with um, the massive amount of influx of population that's going to be coming into these areas to view the eclipse. Um, whether or not that's the only reason, you know, we shall see. So um, a quick discussion on polarity. So we have a wandering North Pole. Currently, our North Pole is due, our poles are due to flip and shift at some point. So one of the reasons is um, in terms of being able to take a look at rock formations, um, uh, we know that the poles flip 
every number of many thousands of years, and we are overdue for one. And we can see that something's about to happen because we have we have two different polarities, right? Um, we have the North Magnetic Pole and the Geographic North Pole. Now, the Geographic North Pole is offset from the Magnetic North. However, it's sort of slowly lurking and wandering back into the alignment with the North Pole. So the thought is, is it moving back into that? And once it's set into that polarity, it's going to completely flip. Um, now, what does that mean? Like, what does it mean when a pole flips? We don't know because we've never been alive as a species with recordings to be able to document what that entirely means. Um, is this a complete reversal? And to what scale are we referring to? Because as above, so below, usually speaking, right, with polarity um, in our electromagnetic fields, um, is this happening all the way down to a subatomic or atomic level, right? Are, are the poles within our bodies um, shifting? Are the poles within an atom shifting? Um, in the Keys of Enoch prophecy, there is a an electromagnetic null zone. That's what it refers to as the sort of three days of darkness where we're literally moving through the wormhole of like north to south in this torsion field dynamic, right? Like everything's like the spherical torsion field, um, like you can see in the bottom right with Earth, for example. Um, is there is there a null zone a period? where there is literally no polarity. And what does that mean? If there's no polarity, um, there's no gravity. If there's no gravity, um, there's no magnetism. If there's no magnetism, like is could there be a potential of a mind swipe? Um, will people literally lose their minds from lack of cohesiveness if this should happen? This is all, you know, I'm just putting out the, the theories, right? I don't necessarily know that this is going to happen. I'm just putting out there like what would happen should this happen. Um, one thing we do know, um, and everyone can probably feel this from within their hearts, is love is the great attractor and unifier. Love is cohesive. Love is magnetic. Fear is the great disintegrator, the great separator. It literally causes people to move out, right? They stop feeling what's in and they start looking without. But if there's nothing strong enough to hold them together, they literally might lose their mind should this happen on the scale that it could potentially happen. And Barbara will be discussing more on polarity as well as a theme. So in addition, you know, we're looking at some major fault line situations that are potentially happening, which might be why the National Guard is being called in. So what are fault lines? So fault lines are the, the magnet, there's, so there's the plates of planet Earth, right? And so a plate is a large scale version. A fault line is a small scale version. So you can see the plates on the upper left, there's major earthquake plates, right? The um, there's like one or against, um, for example, uh, California. Um, but we have what's called a New Madrid fault line that apparently um, runs through the area that is the ground zero for the cross that is happening for the 2017th and 2024 eclipse, literally the dead center. And this is the area that they are concerned about. Um, there are people who study this, um, and this is their focus, and they are saying that should this fault line cause a major earthquake, which we are seeing an escalation of earthquakes right now, right? We've had one in Taiwan uh, recently, a small one in New York. There's been like three or four of them in the last week. Um, but this new Madrid fault line, they're a little bit concerned about it, and um, there are some major areas with it, towns and cities within that area that aren't necessarily built to withstand that, such as places like Memphis. Okay, another really interesting thing that is happening right at the cross of uh, the 2017 and 2024 eclipse are this cicada brood. So as we know, little cicadas, um, they're pretty cute when we see them. They make those, that that vibe, that vibration noise, which can actually be a, a healing noise for a lot of people. But in large quantities, cicada broods are very detrimental to our vegetation. Um, my father, who was people's grandfather's age, um, I had an old father, he discussed times where cicadas would literally come through and just 
like cover the entire ground and eat everything and, and decimate every every type of food and crop in their space. Um, and, you know, he would talk about how, thank goodness, we don't have that anymore. Well, apparently we do. Um, they just, they brood in interesting cycles. So the 13 year brood known as brood 19 um, and the 17 year brood known as brood 13 are going to be crossing over this year, making it the largest brood for cicadas in over 200 years. So when we think of like, <laughs> biblical pestilence components, um, you know, this, this does come to mind. Um, and it's just interesting that these broods are happening, as you can see in this map down below in a few different areas, um, being particularly strong around the ground zero. Now, will the earthquakes that might happen cancel out the broods or will they make them more intense? Uh, who knows? And there's three earthquakes that just occurred. Um, one in Morocco, one in, I believe it's Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And there's one other. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. And the solar flares that are happening. But the cicadas, have you ever heard that sound of them slowed down? Where it sounds like harmonized. Yeah, like they do actually. Choir of angels or something. So the, the, the vibration of cicadas themselves does have a healing effect. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, cicadas are actually really cool that way. Uh, the problem is we just don't want to see that many of them. Um and not and at a time when our farmland is being decimated, right, and bought out, and um, you know, there's there's a food concern um, with the whole thing. Now, a few more interesting components that we're gonna put out there before Barbara um, takes over. Uh, okay, so during this eclipse, um, NASA plans to launch three rockets. Um, into the solar eclipse area. They're gonna launch three rockets at the moon just to see what happens, I guess. You can go online um, to study more on that. Um, CERN also, you know, CERN is very questionable with its intent. Um, the, the CERN is developed under this notion that we're looking for this dark matter that we quote unquote cannot find. If they were to look into the unified physics, they'd realize that that has already been solved, that, that concern and the um, active vacuum uh, it, the, the vacuum of space-time, known as the active vacuum, or previously referred to as the ether, contains infinite energy density, and the positrons in that four space, when they come into the three space of our dimension, are known as electrons, and that's where that extra energy is coming from, and that's why we have the spin speed that we have for the different galactic bodies. Um, not a mystery. Um, however, that is their sort of front for their um, reasons to blast subatomic particles into each other at high speeds using a lot of energy. Um, and so they plan to power up CERN during this eclipse. So that's another strange thing that is happening. Oh, yeah. I was going to mention to Einstein's eclipse here. So there's a famous eclipse um, that presented a rare chance for him to verify the essential consequences of general relativity. So the bending of light by gravity. So his theory, his theory predicted that the rays of light passing near a massive body in space would be visibly bent as they followed the curve in space time created by the body's mass. In the case of a ray of light originating from a distant star and passing near the edge of the sun, Einstein was able to calculate a deflection of 1.75 arc seconds. And so he was able to prove part of his theory. And so there might be some things that they are trying to prove. We do have with Uranus and Jupiter coming conjunct and with Pluto and Aquarius, there's a lot of energy of like big discoveries and big inventions that could be coming on the horizon. So um kind of interested to see how this one plays out for sure. Uh, new discoveries all around, right? The old paradigm discoveries, the new paradigm discoveries, um, you know, it's sort of we, we can find proof for anything that we're looking for, right? Um, sort of a self-fulfilling universe, which is why our conscious collective is so important, right? To override some of these interesting things. Um, so um, so there's, there's a lot of, don't worry about it. There's a lot of prophecies around eclipses and around the ends of times, right? Um, noting that the end of times is just the end of something and the beginning of something else. But what are we going to be beginning after this quote unquote last days of these prophecies that are 
um, a lot of them being self-fulfilled, right, by 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 both both polarities, right, the good and the bad. And um, the Hopi Blue Star prophecy does talk about there will be times when um, things start to shift and those who are not deep in their own spiritual awareness of themselves and their direct their direct connection to spirit and to mother nature are going to go crazy. Um, so it's very important that we have to, we have to go deep and root ourselves very deeply. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a lot in terms of what this all entails, right? Um, uh, you know, so I just spent a lot of time focusing on sort of the demiurgic components. And by demiurge, I mean the false god, right? A lot of these religions are paying homage to a being that has a major ego problem, right? Source Sophia, the or source oneness, right? Like beyond even this, just this universe doesn't live with ego, right? It's so far beyond that. Um, and so here we are under the stronghold of a very powerful collective consciousness of these Abrahamic traditions. And we want to move beyond that. And this is a really great opportunity to plant that seed for the new earth evolutionaries and revolutionaries. Um, so alchemical possibilities, right? Um, initiation, activation, evolution, ascension, judgment of judgment, right? That includes self-judgment ultimately, um, and a great purging, um, and which is interesting because there's a dystopian version of that purging, and then there's the utopian version of that, like detoxification and purging, right? Um, just like a lot of these energies. Um, sacred symbolism, sacred concepts, there's there's the the positive interpretation and then the negative sort of separation interpretation. And so, you know, two sides, one coin, which which side is it going to land on? Um we are ultimately the self-chosen, right? It's there's not a chosen, there is a self-chosen. And in order to be chosen, we have to choose these things ourselves and we have to do the work. Pretending to do the work isn't enough. We have to do the actual work. Um, infusing this purpose and poignant awareness and this this time moment, this moment in time where we can fuse the past and the future together in the present with this poignant awareness and receptivity, right? You can't buy a clear conscience. You know, there's only, the only thing we get to bring with us into the next incarnation of ourselves, whatever that looks like, is what is inside, is what is intangible. And this should be the stuff we're focused on, not the material components. We cannot bring that part with us, no matter how hard we try. Um, opening ourselves to humility, I think is very important, right? Um, it's important to have an ego for self-identity and individuation, but the more we evolve with that individuation, the more we recognize we're all one and to bring with us the humility because we're, you know, even though we might be evolved for this dimension and density, <laughs> there's still so many more to evolve into that we are just so low on that totem pole even though we have that potential and that connection to ourself as a whole, right? So what are we manifesting during this eclipse portal and during the eclipse? This is, we are in poignant time to really call forth the higher vibrations and the higher timelines through with manifestation of our destiny, of love and peace. Like what is our unique talent and service that we're going to bring into this next layer of energies and the next few decades? Um, what is in our hearts? How do we align? Where's our conscious? Are we of pure intention, right? And if and if if we find those little, those areas of dissonance within us that are not of pure intention, you know, seeking our own truth from within, we don't necessarily need to call it out on social media or anything like that. It's going within and like repenting for ourselves. We don't need to go repent at a church or some dogmatic fallen fallen religion, right? The the Christian church has not been of pure of heart since the since Jesus and the Cathars and Gnostics that followed him. They were persecuted and they were murdered by the the, the this council of Nicaea, quote, Christian dome shortly there and after, right? So we don't have like the, the Christ consciousness lives within. And Barbara's going to be speaking a lot to that. Um, 
uh, are our bodies purified? Are our minds purified, right? Clearing that in ourselves and forgiving ourselves and recognizing in ourselves those areas and letting them go. We don't need to hold on to these old stories of ourselves and of the world any longer. This is the age of self-sovereignty where we shed these identity allegiances to anything beyond what we can experience in our field. Um, the more of us who live with love in our hearts and for the evolution of humanity and our resonance with nature, the greater likelihood we align with the collective future that will favor life in harmony versus the death and dissonance, right? We are living in a world that has currently a stronghold, in le at least on the material, tangible world, our governance structures, our monetary structures, right? They are a death, our science structures, they're a death cult, right? So we're the life cult. We're pro Mother Earth, organic evolution, bringing that in. And that's something that they're not going to be able to compete with. And they're not going to be able to keep up with if we continue to evolve because they're hedging all of their bets on material reality. Um, and as we know, consciously through, um, for example, uh, you know, in, in physics, right, with the, the frequency a waveform, particle form duality, we literally create the consciousness that we're forming around us. So we, the more and more of us who hold fast to our visions as a collective, we will learn to interrelate with each other. We might grow additional skill sets and evolutionary components, and we'll be able to call in this new earth. Um, so it's important to be aware and vigilant and prepared for anything and express through a place of space and love and not um, and not from fear. Our collective future literally depends on it. Um, also, I want to give a shout out to Magenta Pixie. If you go on her YouTube channel, she speaks very metaphorically. Um, but one of her most recent videos is on the solar logos and eclipse. Um, it's a beautiful um, expression of what is going on. Um, and she she's a channeler. Um, that's her art uh, and skill set. So, um, so again, um, X marks the spot, um, and it's this omen autobrading things and the shifting and changing of things quickly. So, some of this is what I'm speaking about. Sorry, I can't see my top um, my top lines, but I'm on the. I realize that I'm giving um, some information that also again came from Michael James Garber. Um, with his uh, hypnotic sessions that he has done on his clients. Um, so again, these clients have been referencing an eclipse that is to happen in the future. He's been doing this for about a decade. Um, and one of them is X marks the spot, which is an omen autumn things for a shifting and changing of things rapidly that will be occurring on planet Earth. And he was literally looking for an X on the ground somewhere. And then he realized that this eclipse might have something to do with it. Um, people will be called to different areas and will be in certain groups of people for this event and that will shape them. Um, I do think it is very beautiful to recognize we have a lot of people in our community that will be, um, at the global eclipse, you know, and there will be people there representing all different aspects and places in the paradigms. Um, but there are a lot of new earth visionaries holding space, um, in the totality of the solar eclipse all across this, um, this country. Um, and it's going to be the next level of leadership and evolution for the people who have been doing the work for the last few decades or years. These eclipses are part of how we evolved using the sun and moon to imprint into people's minds. And by 2027, our consciousness is going to be completely different. And not only did um, Michael receive this information in his um, hypnotic clients, I have heard this from there's a few people who channel their higher dimensional selves or um, galactic species of varying places um, that I believe um, stand beyond uh, the false paradigm in their interpretations and alignments. And a lot of them are starting to say this. They're, they're saying that it's going to get worse before it gets better. But by 2026, um, 2025, 2024 to 2026, there's going to be a dark night of the soul. And I think that's particularly going to be poignant for those people who are still living in the old paradigm. Um, but by 2027, we're going to be out of out of that difficult zone and things are going to be manifesting quicker for people who are living in the new paradigm. And we're going to be seeing a lot of innovation that Barbara's going to be speaking towards. Um, 
The next solar event, those working with the higher levels already are going to be shifting to a higher plane of consciousness. We have people like April, I forget her last name. Um, she works with the Galactic Federation, allegedly. And she's saying this is an ascension point. And it's not necessarily going to be this like, maybe it is, but probably not this like massive ascension where we're like literally ascending. But the vibration on this planet is an opportunity for this ascension. And we're going to literally be planting that seed for the ascension of this planet and for ourselves as um, individuals and as a collective. Uh, future eclipses causing massive amounts of cellular changes. Um, Michael, um, this is a direct quote from my friend Michael, impressing into the subconsciousness information that is going to unfold over time. Um, so this is a seed point. Um, uh, he, he himself and myself as well think that this is analogous, analogous to Magenta Pixie's cellular memory cascade that is going to be that is unfolding as we speak. Um, and it's in alignment with channeled messages, um, like I said, from Bashar, Lee Harris, Magenta Pixie, and um, my own research um, into um, plasma energy. Uh, particularly scientific research in the fourth phase of water with Gerald Pollack and May Wen Ho's um, research of coherent excitation in biological organisms. We are literally living, literally, we are living crystals. Our water in, in phase when we're healthy, when it's flowing right in our body is a plasma that follows the fourth phase of water. That water um, and the the fossil matrix of that water, as well as, as our bones, are follow all of the everything that's important and needed to comprehend that we are living liquid crystals and solid crystals. We're literally crystallized beings. And crystals, as we know, can hold information. We can program those crystals with information. So that is exactly what we should be doing right now always, uh, not just with the water that we drink, but with our own waters of our being is programming these waters as crystals. And what are we programming into them? Um, and again, we do this by walking away from the false pharaohs and the false contra constructs. Um, we don't follow, we lead from within. Um, we are the self-chosen, the self-sovereign that we're proclaiming. And there's a big movement on this planet for this. And I love these two different components that I pulled from Earth Star Academy. Um, and it's literally um, the Christ the Christed activation and the heroes gamos of the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine within all of us, right? It's not just the external marriage of masculine and feminine beings, but the masculine and feminine beings within us all. And um, we're in a spiritual timeline war, and it's important that we recognize that and we choose organic evolution over the transhumanistic agenda that's coming upon us on all fronts, right? They're hitting it hard. And they're seeing that people are naturally evolving into um, balanced internal polarity for some, right? Um, but we all carry both polarities within us, the wholesome organic versions. And they're trying to, just like they do with everything, they're trying to basically take that energy and they're trying to invert it. So, uh, and Barbara's going to be speaking a lot on this subject, so I'm not going to go any further on it and because it's literally in the stars. So what am I going to be doing um, <laughs> during this particular timeline? Um, I, I'm almost treating it as though it is Ascension Day um, because it's a seed point for Ascension Day, right? It doesn't have to be as dramatic as how it's expressed um, biblically, though biblically, Half of the Old Testament is written under the demiurgic prophecies that are being synthetically uh, de-escalated, right, and and speeding up right now. And everything in general is de-escalating to these evolutionary moments in time that follow almost this like Euler's and um, uh, sort of logarithmic. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting the word of like the desk the, uh, escalation points. Um, so. I'm I'm treating that the same sort of energies. This is also the same sort of, a lot of this is a similar information for people that were told in biblical times that they approach the Ark of the Covenant. What was the Ark of the Covenant? Um, my opinion is that it was an over-unity technology and energy device. And when, um, you know, Egypt basically fell when allegedly, if the story is accurate, Moses literally took 
the these over unity technologies out of Egypt that were powering the pyramids and the surrounding areas. Uh, without those without those devices, the water no longer flowed, the water dried up, et cetera, et cetera. There was no longer these ionizing energies that we hear existed during Egypt and in places during the Tartarian time periods. Um, but in order to approach such a high ionizing energy, which the sun is literally um, enhancing itself, it's becoming more ionizing. We have the sun and then we have the sun behind the sun, right? Our Hunabku galactic center, which is the next order of energy, um, an order of, of field energy, right? Um, and so we, we, we want to welcome in this ionizing energy because it's literally encoding our internal DNA and activating dormant genes that have not been turned on yet. However, it does steal electrons. And if we're not properly cleansed and if we're not properly grounded and if we're not eating the right foods, um, it steals these electrons from us. So we have to balance ourselves between this photonic ionizing energy and uh, the grounding earth electrons that we can receive from the ground. So my plan, regardless of if you're in path of totality or anywhere on this on this day, you know, trying to get glimpses, you obviously want the dark shades so you don't injure your eyes. And you want to offer yourself a smudging ritual um, for, cl uh, for cleaning yourself and even prepping yourself prior to this time period. Um, you, uh, I plan to be, I'm in an area, um, my front yard <laughs> that um, has grass. So I plan to be barefoot um, and receiving the grounding energy of earth and those uh, healing electrons. Um, the Ark of the Covenant talks about oiling yourself, right? Uh, with olive oil. I plan to use coconut oil. It's a natural sunscreen. I, um, Unless you're very light skinned, I would avoid um, synthetic sunscreen. You can always add zinc to your coconut oil if you like, maybe not too much, but a little bit. Um, hydration is very important with elect, you know, um, spring water or filtered water that has been remineralized. Um, I plan to fast from the, the night prior, um, at least, um, but a uh, light organic produce, you know, some, not everybody can fast for long periods of time. Um, being in an empty stomach would be most ideal. I would imagine, um, frankincense and myrrh, it was obviously mentioned many times, um, therapeutic, you want them to be therapeutic grade essential oils, um, as a spritzer, um, as a scent nape of the neck. Um, or uh, you can consume if they're therapeutic grade internally. Um, orbit, or, ormus, uh, so monoatomic, orbitally rearranged monoatomic gold internally. If you have that, um, that helps enhance your crystalline structure. If you want to augment this energy, you have um, crystals, organite, Egyptian healing rods. I'm getting a yes for that. Um, you know, might be too much for some people. Some people might want to have shungite on hand in case it's too much for them, right? And they want to like pare it down a little bit. Um, uh, obviously, the thing, prayer, um, songs, thinking good thoughts. Um, the whole point is this connection to mother nature. And, oh, I'm sorry, Barbara, I okay. skipped it. So we're going to be moving on to what Barbara has to say now, except for I accidentally mm -hmm. skipped it. Uh, moved past her first screen. Um, so we're going to be transitioning into everything that she has to say. So thank you guys. Great. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Hi, you guys. Thanks for being here. It's definitely an honor to share with you guys. Just going to pull the screen up. So I'm going to give you this quote by a man named Utah Phillips, who, I mean, I love everything that he's ever said. But um, of course, now I can't see it. So I'm actually gonna I'm gonna pull back out of the screen share so I can read it to you because it is kind of an involved quote. Um, so I have a good friend in the East who comes to my shows and says, "You sing a lot about the past. You can't live in the past, you know." I say to him, "I can go outside and pick up a rock that's older than the oldest song you know, and bring it back in here and drop it on your foot." Now the past didn't go anywhere, did it? It's right here, right now. I always thought that anybody who told me I couldn't live in the past was trying to get me to forget something, that if I remembered it, it would get them in trouble. It would get them in serious trouble. No, that 50s, 60s, 70s, 90s stuff, that whole idea of decade packaging, 
things don't happen that way. The Vietnam War heated up in 1965 and ended in 1975. What's that got to do with decades? No, that packaging of time is a journalist's convenience that they use to trivialize and to dismiss important events and important ideas. I defy that. And I have just always loved those words. I love um, this image of the rock and how it relates also to the crystalline structures. So as we know in indigenous um, populations, we have you know, the water representing certain parts of the body. We have the skin representing certain parts of the earth. Um, when I think about crystals and I think about rocks, right? Rocks are like the bone of the earth. To me, crystals are like the nervous system of the earth. And I remember speaking with a friend about that and just stating, um, you know, I don't know why we take these things out of the earth. There might be like really important communication factors and components um, those crystals are formed really slowly over time. Amber, for instance, um, is the sap of a tree, right? And it gets like all this sunlight, like, um, Sifinity was talking about the sunlight and the moonlight and how this pattern, I think of like a photographic flash is how a picture is captured, right? And so when you think about this really slow growing process of crystallization and the light processes that are involved in the formation of that, um, the information technology um, that is present in that knowing, not only in the crystals of the earth, but like she mentioned in the water, the memory of water, um, the hormones that crystallize in our body that conduct our feelings and our emotions and the way that we work transpersonally, the way that we feel, um, you know, it's all interconnected. And so when I think about history being present here and now. Um, I consider all of those things. And I consider the chemical composition, um, the biochemistry, our microbiome, all the ways that all of those things are constantly communicating. Um, and we have all this loud media and this loud technology and we're, you know, screaming songs and television shows at each other. Um, but there's this like underlying voice of existence that we have really kind of forgotten. Um, and so when I think about the past, that's what I listen to. And I listen to the information as well. And I wanna just thank Stephanity for the way that she so beautifully gathers such a myriad um, composition of different ideas and themes and puts it all together with the math and the science. It's really, the human mind is really something to behold. So the first thing that I'm gonna get into um, is this 24,000 year procession through the signs. Um, each sign is gonna be on the vernal equinox or the spring equinox. You'll see that constellation is rising at the spring equinox um, for 2000 years at this point of the earth's wobble. I'll show you some images of that in a moment. And so right now we're just entering Aquarius. Um, you can see right here in light blue, okay? so. From 2013 back to about 26 AD was the age of Pisces. And preceding that for about 2000 years was the age of Capricorn. The reason why these numbers are different depending on the sign is because of the elliptical shape um, of the orbit of the signs around, right? It's not all just like a perfect circle. And so before that, we had the age of Taurus. And I'll get a little bit more into what these ages can have to do with human activity and what we witness. And I'm also going to pull back out of this so that I can read to you. Um, but first, I want to talk to you about the age of Aries. So the Aries and Libra axis are Aries is cardinal fire. So it's like the spark, the fire starter. And during the age of Aries, we had men starting to use and women starting to use fire in a more um, kind of like manipulated way. And so there's a lot of symbolism behind that. Um, the bull is part of the symbolism from Taurus just preceding that. And that was more the manipulation of agriculture, 
um, working with the earth and the animals. So we started to kind of have dominion over the animals and over the plants in a different way. So with Aries, it's fire. Um, friction, you might think of bow drills, those early drills that they used to start fires, um, the sparking of flint and things like that. Um, and they used to say that actually fire was hidden in the plants and the rocks and the trees because they were able to start fire from these things. Um, what else? Um, later during the age of Aries, there is actually the use of gas to start fires and the eventual development of fire machines, which we know um, was eventually turned into weaponry. Aries is also known as the age of warring men. So when you think about tribal warfare, early tribal warfare, there were lots of separated, the population was not as large. And so when people encountered each other, there was territory um, conflicts and things like that, different ways of being, different ways of thinking and talking, the inability to communicate, kind of the beginning of the eventual Tower of Babylon, right? Um, and so this is where these wars came from. And it was very much about defending defending your families and defending your people and defending your resources, um, which is really a very organic thing that arose that um, we see by the end of the age of Aries and moving into the age of Taurus definitely shifted. i um, going to hop out of the screen share real quick so that I can read this in full to you. So the age of Aries is 2,000 to 4,000 years ago. It spanned from 2,000 to 0 BC. This is the time of the great military cultures, the Egyptians, the Persians, the Jewish, the Trojans, the Greeks, the Spartans, the Romans. Aries being a martial and masculine sign put into power cultures, which worshiped the perfect male body and male power and trampled on the female, the rule of the stronger over the weaker. So important to point out is that during the age of Taurus, there's a woman named Marija Gimbutas who actually discovered a whole host of the goddess figures and also discovered that during that time, there were no signs or archeological finds of warring. So during the age of Taurus, we really had this um, kind of goddess worshiping era. And so moving, moving into the age of Aries, we had this really masculine sort of worshiping era. era. Um, so heroes and warriors like Moses, Hercules, Spartacus, Alexander the Great, the law of tooth for an eye and eye for an eye became a mantra. Metallurgy developed, so did engineering, mathematics, and logic, all under the rule of Aries. Aries represents the head. So thoughtful development of some of these very early technologies. Many of these above mentioned cultures worshiped the Ram, the Jews, the Egyptians, and the Romans. So I'm gonna hop back onto the Zoom. Thank you for your patience as some of these pictures are cut off. Um, the next screen that I'm gonna show you in my screen share is gonna be the next age. And you guys can see the whole thing. I'm just gonna read um, some of it and just kind of, you can read it. I'm going to just summarize it for you. So this is the age of Pisces. And as Stephanity touched on, coming out of the age of war, there was a need for a supplement when it comes to kind of a moral compass, because I think that we had really moved towards violence and aggression and separation and opposition and conflict in a lot of ways. And so when we came into the age of Pisces, there was this revelation of spirituality and there's early spiritual practices the beginning of animism or human um, spiritual practice is very very ancient it goes way far back but during this time we really saw the development out of shamanism and early spirituality and into structured systemic religions and so i believe and what you can see in this chart that i'm going to show you in a little bit the evolution of religion it begins with these early spiritual practices that develop into these um, like codified dogmas of how to address morality. And there was a need for that at this time. And so that's how it arose out of the age of warring men. Um, it took 2000 years for these impulses to become more natural for humans, it says here. Um, mind you, we still have so much to strive towards the ideal love of Christ, right? Or any enlightened master but at least the seed was planted. The age of Pisces was full of bloody and barbaric moments. And that just speaks to um, no matter which cycle you're in, it's not like it's all happens all of a sudden. And then it's that way for the entire cycle. There's a moving into 
these concepts, like into these spiritual wisdoms that were established during this time. That doesn't mean that there wasn't horrible things going on um, in the same timeline. So let's see. there was also the refinement of many musical and artistic geniuses that were soaked with mystical inspiration. And so, you know, really for every phase that we go through and every age that we go through, just like in the astrological medicine wheel, for one side of the chart on the axis across from that is an answer to the other side. And it's kind of like with Pisces, the swimming of the fish into different motions. So the glyph of Pisces is the two fish symbolism. The glyph represents two fish tied together, swimming in opposite directions, one the material and one the spiritual. And so it kind of begs this question like the yin yang, where can you find the spiritual within the material? And where can you find the material within the spiritual as one cannot exist without the other? Um, so also during the age of Pisces, we saw lots of water irrigation, so manipulation of water, um, water irrigation, but by the end of the age of Pisces and now moving into Aquarius, we've seen poisoning of the waters. And so our understanding of water as a whole, um, you know, we thought that we could like manifest this architecture with water that was going to better humanity forever. And I think that what we've discovered is that we need to remember the actual wisdom that the water holds might um, be greater than the wisdom that that we may be perceived that we had. So kind of remembering the wisdom that is here in the earth is actually bigger and greater um, than we are as any one human being inventing anything. So returning to the earth wisdom and in Pisces specifically um, with water. So um, when it comes to the material and the spiritual, um, you know, my father is a, a biochemist, as I mentioned, and he really came out of his religious, he was raised in the Catholic church. Um, he was studying to be a Jesuit priest and he started, started to study science and that guided him away. I mean, the magic that he found and, um, the spiritual guidance that he found through his practice of scientific study became greater to him than what he was able to find for himself in the dogmas of the Catholic church. And so I think it's an interesting balance of how we really need to be willing to evolve the ways that we embrace um, defining our moral compass. You know, we as humans can talk amongst ourselves and we can write books and we can tell stories, but at the end of the day, you know, energy doesn't lie. Um, words can tell lies, but energy doesn't lie. And so there's a wisdom there. There's a certain wisdom within that. So after the age of Pisces, of course, we have the age of Aquarius. Um, the glyph and symbolism um, literally means like energy and currency and frequency. And it's an air sign, even though it's the water bearer, which is interesting, moving out of Pisces, that we would basically be kind of introducing some of these ideas of water, like um, the memory that can be held inside of water coming into the age of Aquarius, because Aquarius is also associated with technological advancement. Um, and so kind of remembering these earth technologies becomes um, a really inspiring revelation for everybody to ponder. Hopefully um, we'll get some brilliant scientists on that. <laughs> um, so also Aquarius has to do with liberation and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, liberation for humanity giving us freedom to develop our true individuality and talents rather than just having to toil for su survival. So some of these um, early technologies that we've developed might give us a little bit of a break. And I think about things like AI where it's like, or medicine where it's like you could lean too far into it and you might end up actually like taking away your own ability to have homeostasis and have information coming in and going out for yourself or have um, the right chemical balance within your body if you lean too hard into external sources, right? But when it comes to things like technology and AI, if we use it to the right degree, it can take the load off of our human burden to fix some of the problems that have been arising. We're facing greater challenges than we've ever faced. And I think that the use of some of these technologies um, 
can be, you know, like kind of like our, our right hand tool that we can use to ease the burden on ourselves and free up space to reimagine the way that we want things to be, or some would say to remember the way that things need to be. So um, that's kind of like the end game that I see with the age of Aquarius. And I'll definitely be touching on this some more. So this is the chart of Pluto into Aquarius. And there's several things that I want to point out about Pluto into Aquarius. So the Pluto cycle through all of the signs is 248 years. Um, in 1776, the Declaration of Independence was signed and Pluto's return just happened between 2020 and 2022. So it was basically the United States of America's Pluto birthday, if that makes sense. And so um, at the same time, simultaneously now earlier this year, we see Pluto coming into Aquarius. Aquarius is liberation, revolution, invention, um, discoveries, and definitely we're seeing this kind of like breaking apart of the identity or individuation of, of our country as an identity where everything that we created has kind of come to this culmination. And it all ties in also with the Saturn and the Uranus cycles. So with Aquarius being liberation, with Pluto being transformation, death and rebirth, these alignments with Pluto um, call directly to our transformation as a country. When you add in the Saturn and Uranus um, transit that happened last year, Saturn is risk boundaries, okay, the concept of boundaries. So when you think of boundaries, these are things like laws, restrictions, architectures, designs. We have designed our country. We have architected um, this entity that is the United States of America. And Saturn representing boundaries can also represent restrictions that we have placed upon ourselves, restrictions that we have placed upon each other, um, restrictions that we have placed upon the world. So when you think of boundaries, you can really think of it in a lot of different ways. The positive aspect of boundaries is that if you masterfully architect your structures, you can actually achieve liberation. So you can either architect structures that bind you and bound you in. This is on a personal level too. Or you can architect masterfully in a way that liberates and allows for easy flow. Um, that being said, of course, in 2020, we also saw as this Pluto return was happening, the pandemic arise. And so that really harkened back into other systems like the medical system, our governmental systems. How are we dealing with and handling um, our personal evolution and transformations within the structures of this architecture that we've built of our country. Um, are we happy with what we've built? Can we let things go and reimagine a new way to handle some of this stuff? Because we have a lot of old structures in place that are due for some evolution. And so I think that Pluto is really asking us um, as we enter into Aquarius to find some new ways of reimagining and rediscovering the way that we've done things. Um, so yeah, so we're going to be in the age of Aquarius with Pluto. So this is Pluto moving through Aquarius, which is different than the 2000 year um, age of Aquarius. So it's important to delineate that. Um, the 2000 year um, age of Aquarius is the wobble. So the sun and the moon are pulling the gravitationally on the earth and creating us to wobble like if we were a spinning top sitting on top of a table, okay? And as we move, that circle that moves over our crown is the procession of planets that hit the vernal equinox every 2,000 years, if that makes sense. So it's a greater cycle. It's a much greater cycle than us. But we are still at the center of that cycle. The bigger yuga cycle, which is even greater than that, we are not at the center. There is a galactic center, so a center of the galaxy. And so there is also a procession around the center of the, of the galaxy. And we actually just aligned with the galactic center earlier this year. 
um, into this sheath of the galaxy where there's like a lot of different um, stars and activity and everything. I'm still learning about all of this. But so there's so many massive alignments that are happening. And from those greater cycles into the slightly shorter cycles, Pluto is the longest cycle planet. Okay. And so Pluto moving into Aquarius, it's going to stay there for 20 whole years. That's a long time um, compared to the amount of time that other planets stay. So it affects us on a grander scale on the world stage, and it affects us for a longer time. So let me see if there's anything else that I wanted to touch on. Oh, yeah. So the Saturn Uranus Pluto cycles go back and are reflected in um, like the early the earlier ones that he talked about, Richard Tarnas, in um, the documentary that he created. The earliest cycles that he documented are like the French Revolution. OK, so lots of revolutionary activity. Also, like early um, liberation movements. So the freedom of the slaves happening moving into later um, human rights, like women being able to vote and then trying to end war during the Vietnam War. Those all set these hit these Saturn Uranus Pluto cycles. And so it's whenever there's oppositions or challenging angles, like Stephanie was mentioning with the gray, the green, what was it called? Negative green. The negative green. So those angles of squares and oppositions that happen in a chart um, or in the transits often represent challenges and lessons that are being posed upon us in the planets that are further away from the sun and longer moving. Typically it represents the world stage or humanity as a whole. Whereas the planets that are closer to the sun are more representative of personal shifts and personal experiences. So those are called the personal planets. Um, so Pluto is a big deal that all happening just before all of the rest of this stuff happening. Um, certainly every astrologer that I know or anybody aware of these things was like, oh, this is going to be some stuff coming up. So um, definitely had a little bit of a warning and started looking into things. So the age of Aquarius. So there's kind of like this bifurcation that people like Magenta, Magenta Pixie and other channelers have talked about. And what I see is that um, there's this possibility, right, of this kind of cyberpunk dystopia with the age of Aquarius because it's technology, it's Wi-Fi, it's flying cars, and it's, um, you know, lots of like energy, um, electricity, things like that. And so you imagine like if we went all the way in that direction, like as extreme as, as extreme as possible, we would end up like in the movie Idiocracy or something like that. Um, there's all kinds of things that could arise from that. There's all kinds of dangers that could arise from that. Um, it's it's not the pathway forward um, that I would like to imagine for humans. And so I think this is just a little bit of a caution. And I started to think about this and I was like, okay, so if we have all this technology and this electricity and all of this like media and information and this explosion of all these like scientific revelations and everything, how can we have that become the answer? to the cyberpunk dystopia problem, right? And so in my mind, I started to think of organic technology. And so organic technology is basically just remembering Earth's technology, but finding a way to guide ourselves gracefully from what we've created with this cyberpunk dystopia and kind of like working in and engaging regenerative farming working with our microbiomes um, as a preventative measure before just taking like chemical medicines, right? How do we take the agricultural practices that we're doing and actually have it working back with the earth, right? We're bringing the soil back to life right now. Um, all we have to do is use a no-till method and now we're recapturing all the CO2 again. So there's some basic earth knowledge and technologies that are also coming to light that can actually save us and really be like the balancing factor for the age of Aquarius. So on the opposite side of the chart from Aquarius is Virgo and Virgo is earth and Virgo is material. And so when you think of my dad is like a super Virgo and he's really into like chemistry and chemicals and um, you know, the brain and the body and the receptors and all of the things. And I think that we are going to be able to bring back into like 
the earth material being used to conduct the technologies in a way that aligns better with all the spiritual lessons that we can now take with us forward out of the age of Pisces. Um, so it's just a matter of really like achieving some homeostasis and a sense of balance. So that's age of Aquarius. That leads us right into the full moon lunar eclipse. So the full moon lunar eclipse occurred on the 25th of March. And as you can see, this is a very polar chart. And the reason why I'm talking you through the ages of the Kali Yuga is because this chart is all focused in the preceding three ages before the age of Aquarius. So Taurus, Aries, and Pisces. So it really, I believe, hearkens us to remember the lessons that have been learned over the preceding ages. We have the sun opposite the moon here. So the sun is in Aries and the moon is in Libra during this eclipse that occurred. The sun being in Aries, a lot of this like amping up of all the war energies and everything that have been taking place really have been getting balanced out by people's sense of nurture for humanity. I think we're really starting to look at what's happening and question if this is how we want to identify as a unified species. Like, do we want to have these things going down in our world? Um, this is also happening within us, right? We have our battles within and our shadows within. So as we are seeing that in the world outside of ourself, astrology always asks us to see the same thing within ourselves. And I think um, there's this line about goldfish, um, you know, goldfish have no memory. I think their lives are much like mine. And the little plastic castle is a surprise every time. Well, that's an Ani DeFranco quote, but essentially what she's talking about is how goldfish don't have any memory. And here we are finding ourselves in these same cycles over and over and over again as a species. And, oh, it's a war again. So devastating. And so, and it's time for us to look within ourselves and individually, like every human being, and realize that no matter how much we support peace and no matter how much that we feel divinely aligned within ourselves, there's clearly more efforts that need to be made to have some changes occur to keep these kinds of wars from happening again. And so I think that um, these charts just really call to everybody to take a deep look within, especially with Chiron present. Chiron can really represent like our core wounds and our core healing. Um, and it's present here with the North node, which is our future karmas. The nodes of the moon represent our future and our past karmas and just our personal future and past within our lifetime. And so when we look at our karma as a species and we look at the karma of the earth, right? Um, the earth has the best karma <laughs> of anything. Okay. But as a species, um, we're not really caring for the earth right now. And her karma can override us if we don't start to work with her and what she needs. And when it comes to our healing and our nurturing, these wounds from Aries and the age of war have really affected us and deeply wounded us. And we have ancestral traumas. We have traumas associated with, with our religious practices, with the warring of the religious practices, with domination, manipulation, narcissism that we see not only in cultures and societies and governments, but amongst our brethren and our sisters. And so how do we take all these tendencies towards codependency and narcissism on all these different levels and choose to find kind of a homeostasis where we are each cared for and we are each nurtured in a way that does not beg for ego inflation? Um, these labels are not intended to um, be used in the standard way. When I think about psychology and I think about these labels, um, like narcissism or, or bipolar, we have to understand that the rise in these tendencies come from our internal battles and struggles. And so I feel like with Chiron, the wounded healer, it really represents um, in the sign of Aries, which is the god of war that we need to address our wounds and discover our healing. So when I was giving this reading with several friends online the other day, 
um, a friend showed me, she's in Hawaii right now. And she showed me the line where the volcano had taken out a bunch of trees and where the live living part of the forest still was. And she was talking about like looking out at that line and just thinking and pondering. This is the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And so this water here, this blue water down here is living water. There's animals in the water. There's kind of a normal balance of plant life. And this right here is um, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico where everything is dead. There's no fish, there's no anything except for this one seaweed that is growing and creating this color that you're seeing here. And that seaweed is the only plant that Gaia has, the only plant that Earth has that can come in to restore life in that area. And so when I think about that bifurcation and I think about um, that yin yang that you can see just like so clearly on the screen, I think about the healing and I think about the wounding and I think about the natural processes that we have to overcome all of it and how much more strength we have as a species to fix what has happened and um, enhance what is beneficial so um, just a little bit of a beacon of hope there with the moon opposite that sign of war that we can remember our hearts and we can remember our mother moon and we can remember how to nurture others and nurture ourselves, nurture people that have different labels, nurture all of the things, you know, um, is really the only way to bring the life back to a point where we're at homeostasis with Gaia. Think about the banyan tree too. Oh yeah. 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 There's lots of symbolism, right? Yeah. The tree of life. And um, I'm going to actually show you an image in a little bit that definitely harkens back to that as well. So this is the April 8th eclipse and the April 8th eclipse um, coming up. So we have most everything now in those three signs. The moon is no longer opposite. The moon is now conjoined with the sun at 19 degrees of Aries, exactly conjunct Chiron, exactly to the 19th degree. And I want to read to you the Sabian symbol. The Sabian symbols were developed for every degree of the Zodiac by a woman named Elsie Wheeler hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Um, and it's amazing how the degrees line up um, when you read her work. So Aries at 19 degrees is rising above ordinary perception. Relaxing the mind supports a creative, positive, and visionary way of seeing things. Training how to release the grasping, life, grasping mind. A way of life refusing hectic involvement in social competition and wasteful overproduction allows for development of unattached, transcend understanding. When in repose, the creative mind can better sur survey our present situation, and then stuck routine can be transformed into a new holistic perception. The magic carpet of oriental imagery is how it was titled by um, Dane Rudier. So if you haven't looked into the Sabian symbols, they're pretty interesting. And I think it, that just really sums up um, a lot of how I feel about this. The sun and the moon here conjuncting in Aries are sandwiched by Mercury and Chiron. Mercury is communication. Mercury is the messenger of the gods. And so with the eclipse happening between Mercury and Chiron, I think we're being asked to communicate about our healing and our nurturing. We're being asked to communicate and speak out about the wounding of our species. We're being asked and called to speak out about the wounding of our of ourselves personally, not only by other cultures, but by governments, by systems, by organizations, by others in our community, not in a calling out way, but in a way of finding solutions to not only heal ourselves from the wounding, that's occurred on us, but to recognize the wounding that occurred upon that person to feel the need to wound us. It's really important that we're doing the shadow work to understand that we are all human and that all of our actions um, can be seen in a light of um, an authentic lived experience that is necessary for every human life to kind of have that witness. Um, so also coming together right now is Jupiter and Uranus, as you can see here, um, happening in Taurus, which I love. And we're going to get to that 
chart actually in a little bit. So that's kind of um, most of the astrology of the eclipse. Oh, Neptune and Venus sandwiching the cusp of Pisces and Aries. So Neptune is the visionary. Neptune is also um, can represent escapism because it's the dream space. And so that is the space where we imagine, but it can also be a space where we escape and it can hearken to things like addictions, um, to different substances, different states of mind, sexuality, shopping, money, um, gossiping, like anything that you can have an addiction to that allows you to escape reality um, can be called to with Neptune also. But when you have clarity of mind or clear vision, um, you are actually able to create visionary action into the future in a different way. So it's really important to keep your mind clear at this time. Um, if you're a person that has tendencies towards escapism, it's just a good time to really be taking a look at that because our sensual experience right now is in the sign of Aries and in the dominion of all of the conflicts and wars that are happening. And so it's kind of a dangerous space to be escaping. Um, so keeping that clarity in mind and really um, allowing yourself to cleanse and clear and detox, be eating the best possible foods, be doing all the things to clear your space, um, really, really important in this time. Um, let me see. Another thing that I wanted to talk about is when we get to the end of an Aries cycle, what we start to see is the opposite side of that axis show up, which is Libra. So we saw a little bit of that with the lunar eclipse where we were getting in touch with our heart center around what's happening. But it's important to remember that Aries is also the hero's journey. So at the same time as there's these people that are warring, that are creating conflict, there's also the hero, the, far, the spark, the fire of the heroes that are planted all over the world. There's people in all of these war-torn areas, Sudan, Congo, um, you know, obviously Palestine, there are men rising up and taking in the children that have lost their parents. There are people rising up doing humanitarian work. The age of Aquarius is also associated with humani humanitarian work. And so it's really important to have that balance of remembering, like we have a tendency to place media focus on the disaster. And um, when I get to some of these next parts, we're going to end up going over a little bit. I hope you guys don't mind. Um, so the middle path, I want to talk about the middle path. Um, this painting blew my mind when I saw it because it so perfectly sort of summed up the way that I was feeling about um, what to do, what to do with all these energies. Um, so the polarity without, okay, and the middle path is like a main theme that I'm getting from the solar eclipse. And the shapes of all the triangles, right? And everything that Stephanie has pointed out, hearken back to um, this Da Vinci painting of the crucifixion. Um, my dad used to sing a song called um, Three Men on the Mountain. And it's talking about Jesus and he had the two men on either side. And this is actually a Rosicrucian diagram of the Christ, the Antichrist, the Lucifer. On the other side of that is Satan. So um, in like a lot of modern practices, people see Lucifer and Satan as the same thing, but it's actually two separate things. And the two men on either side of Jesus represent those two different aspects of how you can veer off the middle path into evil ways. And so both of the men on either side of him have their head turned a different way. The man on the right has his head turned towards Jesus. And in the actual story of this painting, um, asked to be accepted into the kingdom of God. And of course, Jesus says, you will be in, in the kingdom of my father tonight. The other man turned his head away. And the man on the right said out loud and recognized that Jesus was the only one who didn't deserve to be there. And so I think it's important to remember that in the midst of all of these symbolisms of evil and darkness that we're seeing, there's many fold paths that we get to choose to take. And history is the evidence of our evolution and the choices that we make. The middle path is the pathway where choice occurs. You have a decision to stay the middle path and not veer off towards 
any type, right? You have the light and you have the dark. And what I recognize is there's right, like evil Satan worshiping where it's like they're sacrificing animals and bloodlust and murder and rape and, and things. And then we have the opposite end of that, which is the divine light beings who look down upon all of other humans who are not as clean, who are not as worthy, who are not as um, capable, who are not right. And so there's this interplay between light and dark that we really need to recognize and see. I'm not going to go too far into it, but I do want to also recognize the balancing of the masculine and feminine with the Vesica Pisces shape. Um, at the center of the Rosicrucian cross is a rose. And if you line this Vesica Pisces up with the circle on the previous image of the cross, it actually puts this rose, this heart, right on the chest of Jesus hanging on the cross. And I think that the symbolism with the light eclipsing the dark and the capability to actually recognize what would Jesus do based off of the actual Essene prophecies, the Rosicrucian knowledge, the Zoroastrian knowledge. Um, I'm just going to skip, keep skipping forward a little bit and start moving a little bit more quickly. On the 20th of April, because I know we're going over now, um, the Jupiter-Uranus Chiron conjunction is occurring. Um, this is the most significant astrological transit of the entire year, as far as most astrologers are concerned right now. And so what you can see um, over here is that Uranus and Jupiter and the sun and Chiron and Venus and Mercury and the North Node are all conjunct um, within a very tight space. But most significantly, the exact conjunction of Uranus. Uranus is the natal planet of Aquarius, the sign of Aquarius. So Uranus holds a lot of the same qualities as the sign of Aquarius when it comes to advancement, liberation, revolution, um, rising above. The actual glyph of Uranus symbolizes rising above. So if you think of the circle at the bottom as being um, like this plane, the line going up and across and expanding out, that outward shape almost reminds me of like radio, um, radio, you know, those discs that they like point in different directions. Um, so, and energy and electricity and all of those technology things. And it's with Jupiter, Jupiter expands everything that it touches. Jupiter represents enlightenment. Jupiter represents um, abundance. It can also represent overabundance. It can also represent hoarding, like an abundance of things that you have that maybe you shouldn't have as much of. We've definitely seen during the age of Pisces, the rise of the pyramid structure. And so I think of things like corporations, religions, systems that are top down. Even in medicine, we have like, you know, people who have become doctors of medicine who has lo have lost their ability to like identify or acknowledge any of the other like holistic practices or anything because they're the authority. They're the top-down authority of what is medicine, right? And so really like um, into coming into Aquarius, kind of flipping some of those things upside down. Um, an image that has been really in my mind a lot lately is if you took that cross and you spun it it would be like a vortex or a centrifuge. Um, and if you take the centrifuge and you flip it upside down, right? It's more of like a pyramid, sort of a shape. Um, but if you flip it upside down, it's the opposite, not only the opposite cross, but the opposite shape, the opposite motion. Centripetal. And the, yeah, yeah, centrifugal. And Tri so centrifugal versus centrifugal. Centripetal. Centripetal, thank you. I'm glad that you're here. Um, and so I love that, you know, we can kind of like flip things on their head, which is a thing that eclipses definitely represent like revelation, revealing things, revealing secrets, um, coming to a reckoning about things. Um, and of course here on this chart, we see this triangle shape, which is actually more of a kite shape and harkens back to the shape of the cross. So when I'm look at the, looking at this, I'm thinking of it spinning. 
my dad used to get me posters of fractals when I was little and he would put them on the wall and I just thought they were cool because they were drippy. But um, when I think about how shapes and how the geometry and how the symbolism of life has been really documented in two-dimensional, three-dimensional, um, you know, fourth-dimensional space and everything through time, there's this other dimension with those reverse fields of centrifugal and centripetal forces. And when you think about fractals and how they operate and how they're structured, um, it opens possibilities of space-time, which we can incorporate inside the way we think and will eventually be reflected outside in the way that we envision things. Um, so additionally, again, with Chiron, the wounded healer being co-present and the sun being our raw being as individuals, um, our healing becomes really important and our clear vision and our clear communication with Mercury and with Venus. Venus is our sensual experience. So it's the experience of our senses are what we see, what we hear, um, what we say, like what, what we perceive, what we feel. Um, our sensual experience is affected by the clarity of our mind. So you can have a different perception based off of what mindset you're in. Um, and based off of that mindset and that perception, you are now going to communicate in a way that is reflected out of that. So really remembering our ripple out and how every choice that we make of how we're processing our thoughts, how we're thinking through things and how we're communicating and expressing to the universe, it's gonna affect the feedback that we get over time. So when it comes to expansive individuation, Jupiter is expansion, Uranus is individuation, okay? As it is liberation and rising above, it also represents individuation. Neptune is the collective and Uranus is individuation. And so we've really seen, just like with the Tower of Babylon, um, this sort of like separating from the one. At one point, we were just all one species and we just existed and operated without considering our differences as much. And over time, we've been split into these different communities and different countries and different cities and different towns and counties and religious dogmas and different um, labels of what diseases we have and different labels of our sexual identity and how we identify with all kinds of different things. And it's been separation, 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 separation. And I feel like we have reached sort of a maximum of, of expansive individuation when it comes to the splitting apart, but the absolute most extreme expansive individuation is to pour back into the collective. Because when you remove those labels, we all stand as individuals. And when we have our own personal Jesus, our own personal Buddha, our own personal, we have a fingerprint that's as unique as our body. We have a hormone structure and a microbiome that's as unique as our DNA and as unique as the chart of the stars that was in place at the moment that we were born. There's not a single other human being that will have all those things lined up with the same crystals under the ground beneath our feet that formed with the light and the dark over those thousands and millions and billions of years on the earth, conducting the energy and the frequency and the language of the earth at that moment in space, time and energy that you came into this place, right? And so when you think about how unique we all are, the respect that we have for one another's individuation becomes really, really important in order to come back to the one. You cannot return back to the one if you are placing judgment upon the experience and the lifetime of another individual. You will never reach that reunification because you hold yourself as separate. And I think that that is the most um, pivotal message that we can receive in this time. And I'm just going to show you a few more visuals. So this right here is the evolutionary tree of religion. And it's a little bit of a complicated infographic, but it's actually ingenious. And all it really is, is the truth. 
in a lot of ways. So over here's the timeline. It goes all the way back to about a hundred thousand years um, before the coming of Christ or zero CE. Um, and it comes all the way up to present time around the 2000 mark. Up here at the top, there's a color coding for the different regions of our planet. Down here, the most ancient symbolic discovery through archaeology. All of these symbols are symbols that were discovered through archaeology and dated through scientific practice, okay? Um, carbon dating and things like that. They might even have a more sophisticated way now. I don't know. But the oldest symbol is the spiral. And that is found in Africa at that time. There's actually an updated version of this now. So this one's actually outdated a little bit. But what we see is that one of the earliest branches off of those early, early humans is the goddess symbol at about 40,000 BCE, which moves up into Europe. We also see a split directly that just kind of stays there in the region of Africa. We also see the splitting out of the basic sects of shamanism. Go, there's some down here too. This is the aboriginals and that's where this bottom split down here comes off of. So you can really see if you just take a second to like take in the branching, you can see that there's areas where there's a lot of splitting. There's areas where there's less splitting. There's areas where um, certain lines are completely cut off and maybe taken over by other lines. And just by this basic study of the archeological symbolism and the dating, it is a visual infographic representation of the wars, the famines, the ancestral traumas that have taken place and the spiritual revelations and the birthing of these new spiritual understandings that happened in different part of the world, right? Um, it's just a very interesting thing to study. And it really is such an amazing infographic that shows the expansive individuation that has been going on. It is the Tower of Babylon witnessed um, through archeological finds. And you can find this just by searching the evolutionary tree of religion. This is 2.0, there's a 3.0. Um, and he also has a YouTube channel that you can go to. His name is Simon Davies. Um, his YouTube channel is Mythopia. And he actually goes in and does all these different series of the mythology of all of these different regions and cultures. Um, it's fascinating work. And to me, much more revealing um, and, um, Zoroastrian. Yeah, those are, oh yeah, the Zoroastrians are right here, you guys. Um, and the Rosicrucians are also right here. And you can see that in the Middle East, we come up through the Canaanites who are the same root that eventually become Judaism, Islam, Christianity, Hellenistic Judaism. You see the Zoroastrians are kind of a split off and over as are the Vedic and the Hindu. And so as you can see, just by that little snippet, what you can get and start to understand about how these different spiritual practices interplay, the dotted lines are where mythologies line up with spiritual practices in completely different regions of the world. And what that shows is migration in a similar way that we see migration when we look at um, maternal DNA haplogroups. And so these two infographics don't align, although I imagine a day when there will not only be a combined infographic with the DNA haplogroups and the different spiritual practices, but also hopefully how these different haplogroups relate to um, the structure of our star chart and how that is reflected in our DNA. This is work that probably would not be done without the technology of AI. Um, so I'm hoping that we start to see some truths come to light that are undeniable, that are able to discount um, some of the legs that the more evil, manipulative, narcissistic powers that be stand on. Um, so this is just a quote. Oh, mankind indeed, 
we have created you from male and female and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. And I love this, this is from the Quran. Um, we're not here to judge each other and to war with each other. We are here to know one another and respect each other. And this is not only the most basic teaching of the Quran, but every major spiritual practice worldwide. And it's just a remembering. This art is Autumn Sky. Um, when I first saw it, I posted it. It's the hands of several we women weaving the rainbow web. And um, I just love that image. And one last quote, and I will have to pull out of the screen share to read it, but this is Alan Watts. When I was like 12 or 13, my mom handed me this book, Alan Watts, Psychotherapy East and West. And what he was talking about was um, the confusions of this age where people are treating Christianity with Buddhism and treating Buddhism with, you know, Hinduism. And there's been this, like that ultimate phase of Babylon where it's like the different wounds and ancestral programs and patterns that we've um, woven ourselves with are finally coming to this point, right? Where, oh, it's like really just all the same basic wisdoms and truths. And so I want to read the quote and then um, we'll hop back on and talk a little bit about what comes next. If then man is to rediscover his own image in the macroscopic and microscopic worlds, which science reveals, this will be the own image in which God is said to have created him. And I just love that. And Stephanie, of course, brought her amazing minds. She always finds the coolest images. I generated those images. Thank you. Oh, they are, they are created <laughs> in collaboration with other I, I forms of intelligence. For one of them. Oh, perfect. I love that. So yes. And that go, go back to the screen. Is okay, yeah. Let me go back to it. I love these images. I was like looking at it all night while I was studying. Yeah. So which one is the expansive individuation? The one on the left. Wow. That's has, what Midjourney um, decided. Yeah, yeah. To do it. Um what and are then, the other ones? I think we have two more. Oh, slides. there's more after this. Yeah. Did you use that in one of your classes too? Um, the one on the right. Yeah. Yeah. I know the one on the left. <laughs> oh yes, I forgot I was gonna do this part. So this is Benjamin Netanyahu's chart, and Benjamin Netanyahu's chart. There was an eclipse occurring at the time that he was born, and so you can see the sun and the moon are conjunct over here in the sign of Libra. So this is also happening on the same eclipse axis as the, the April 8th and March 25th eclipses. Um, so he has co-present with his sun and moon conjunction in Libra, which is the sign of peace, which is really the sign of peace and harmony. And so it kind of begs us to ask if what we are being shown is in line with the reality of who this human being might be um, because all we have is a screen. We can't be there and we can't know. And I just hearken back to that principle of non-judgment that it is so important for us to have during this time. I feel like there's all kinds of possibilities with new Neptune co-present here that the way his um, journey started you know, may have been affected by this dream space. He maybe is not operating out of clear thought and clear vision. Um, Mercury is communication. And so the communication of the collective plays a big role in his life. And he may be so harmonized um, or in union with the dreams and visions and voices of the collective in his life that he may have lost that raw being within himself that was so connected to harmony and balance. Libra can also, though, just represent the law. So oftentimes people who are politicians can also play a, a large role in the justice system in some way or another. It's also, I want to just add, in terms of possibility for interpretation mm -hmm. there, 
which is so interesting that you mentioned the whole peace and harmony thing because he seems to be acting in the opposite mm-hmm. um that perhaps his actions of extremism um as a catalyst for um for everyone else mm-hmm. to you know boomerang like mm-hmm. into the piece because people Absolutely. are so over the war component mm-hmm. and, and that particular prophecy that he's trying to fulfill. Totally. yes that's such a good point also because it's in the 10th and 11th house that this is happening because that is the world stage like huge organizations yes don't shines also have like shadow aspects and so mm-hmm. it's possible that he's kind of like you said, he's yes. in, in, uh, embodying these shadow aspects and yeah. this as a collective to reach. Mm-hmm. And I want to speak to that a little bit because when it comes to the recycling of ancestral trauma that we see in lots of different cultural cultures and societies, um, for instance, when we look at the Holocaust, how is it possible that even after the experience of the Holocaust, there could be a human being that identifies with that um, culture who could so clearly recreate um, an environment that was fought so hard to overcome, that's being fought so hard still to overcome. And I think that that is the shadow of extremism, right? And we're seeing Uranus with that Jupiter conjunction, that extreme overabundance, the overreaction of like, you know, the bully in the hallway that pushes you and you turn around and stab him in the throat. Just the, the victim, you know, the betrayer yeah. um, feedback. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that's another reason why with the judgment, um, the non-judgment way, like the middle path way of recognizing that those who hurt have been hurt. And instead of placing judgment, place discernment understanding logic and reasoning um to not be acting out of emotion and not be acting out of um rage or revenge um and having a tempered reaction how about the illusion of it we have a lot of illusion going on where we we see we're shown things and we don't know if they're real or not Mm -hmm. and it may yes we may be shown something that's totally opposite of like you said, his innate being, mm-hmm. and it's because that's the way they want to put a turn on it. Yeah, to put it out into the public was his attempt at mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. the media to help everybody yep. see. Totally, so they look at him a different way, and through this process with him, I always just cue into the fact of what his innate being is, and watch the show and see how it unfolds. Mm-hmm. Time tells. Time always tells the truth. And according to the time when truth comes up, mm-hmm. everything that's been hidden mm-hmm. and deceiving, all of a sudden, it's like, okay, this is what you've been told, but look, this is what it really is. Yeah, absolutely. And and in the macrocosms and microcosms as well, to that point, with our history, you know, the deceptions of recent history um, alone, you know, current events, not to mention recent history, not to mention like the herstory that's been completely forgotten and annihilated where, you know, black has become white and we're just trying to pick up the pieces and interpret what's actually going on. And, and to, to the point with the, the shadow aspects, like I said, sometimes we have to see um, what isn't in order to figure out what is, you know, and we have to exp- learn these lessons the hard way as a species and as individuals sometimes as well. And, um, and also, you know, another interpretation um, that, that could come with what you just expressed too, could be, um, you know, he might be living in, in, coming from a place of, as a warmonger. However, from his perspective, he's bringing on the second coming and ultimately peace by destroying Palestine and taking over, I mean, in, in bit, Jewish prophecy, that entire continent or peninsula all the way to the Euphrates River is to be the Zionist state. And so for his perspective, it's the war turns into peace. But from our perspective, you know, it's, it's, a you know, complete genocide. 
And it really reflects like with the Kali Yuga where they talk about like the dark ages leading to the light ages, leading to the dark ages, leading to the light ages. It's that same thing of the yin yang where, um, you know, we move closer to a perceived truth only to realize that we are now further from the other truth to realize that we, it's just that ever echo of just the way things are, you know, and the grass is it's such a basic truth, but the grass is always greener on the other side. When you are living in a space of peace, war seems horrible. But when you are living in a neighborhood that's being bombed and you're being starved, war seems like the only way to find peace. And it is, that's the recycling, right? And that's where balances, you know, staying in the middle path. Well, and the evolution too, from a mm -hmm. tantric position um, with Advaita Vedantism and in, in Hinduism, um, if if everything is hunky dory perfect, there is no catalyst for growth and change. And we are eternally evolving species. Um, you know, we're not at the apex of our evolution by a long shot. And so, um, it's a you know, I think we have more than what we ask for at this point, but. Um, bringing in different aspects of 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 chaos can act as a catalyst for growth and evolution so we don't become so complacent in a quote-unquote like perfect society that all we see is stagnation and the same with illusion you know a certain degree of illusion calls you to define something solid something stable something structured and i was thinking about anarchy earlier because you know with the dissolvement of a lot of these systems that we're gonna probably start to see you know a lot of people are like scared of anarchy you know and it's like well the chaos is going to happen either way when something needs to be restructured and so focus on the reimagining and focus on the on the restructuring of something that can be tangible yes the seal's already broken they have to be reforged so um i think the question is what is the um, what is the mo with the most ease? How can we reforge these without the duress that is going to be inevitable? Hopefully, for those of us that are holding these new Earth visions, it's going to be a lot easier for us. But you know, just by virtue of proximity and care for our fellow brethren, we're going to be all feeling it regardless. And during these transition times, so also should, if we maintain the middle. Balance, you can learn a lot from being able to more clearly observe both extremes and to be able to move through it rather than get caught up in it, which throws you off the track. Then you become part of the issue and not part of the solution. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like as Nietzsche's quote says, this is not quite verbatim, but you know, be mindful that when battling monsters, you yourself does not also become a monster. And I'm seeing a lot of people who see the problem um, on the same depth and level as those of us in this room. Um, but the their solution is still on that Hegelian dialectic where you're literally working in the same the opposite side of the pendulum mm. like the symbol you were showing with satan and lucifer you know it's like one extreme um and then th the opposite extreme of that answer is still on that same pendulum and it's just going to yo-yo back mm -hmm. and what a, truly we need to do is get off that level like that frequency and you know act octave up to the next level to see the totality as a whole and to offer solution from a larger perspective otherwise we're just going to keep playing out on the same hamster wheel over and over again absolutely but it is pretty amazing when you look at an individual's chart Sorry, I, lined up with the eclipse I no no it's the i loved everything you said <laughs> feel free to cut me off whenever you want um but yeah it's interesting when you look at your natal chart lined up with the eclipse chart, what you can then see, because depending on what rising sign you have, the eclipse will fall in a different house. And so what house the eclipse is present in can show you what area of your life you're going to be most experiencing this eclipse and what tools might be available to you, what, what additional 
squares or oppositions or challenges you might be having um, and what gifts through the triangular. So that's another thing I meant to mention earlier is that triangular trines and sextiles in the chart are typically gifts and positive qualities that feed into any given placement. And so all these triangles that we're seeing, though they may be associated with like horns and, you know, people would think of like Baphomet or something like that. Actually, they can be like a very divine, a divine presence. And so, yeah, you can find that in your chart. So, so Barbara is offering um, a really wonderful opportunity um, for anyone who's interested in giving the natal transit readings. Wonderful. So I know a few people signed up for that. Um, we're going to, so first, before I continue, um, here's our contact information. A lot of you guys already know us pretty much, so where to find us. Um, we hope to offer this recording on Barbara's Astral Body Astrology YouTube video. And so um, if you guys want to share it with anybody else, um, we find this information pretty potent uh, before Monday. And so here is our information and we're going to end the recording right now. And so Barbara will handle that. Thank you guys. Hey. So thanks.